Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this afternoon's uh, session of Linux ConfAU 2017. Our first presentation for this session is from William Brown. Uh, he is uh, with Red Hat, and he will be talking to us about getting into the rusty bucket. Please make him welcome. Thank you all very much for coming here. I know it's been a long week. You're all falling asleep. I mean, very excited for my talk. I, my, as, as I was introduced, my name is William Brown. I work for a very small Linux company called Red Hat. You might have heard of them. They're pretty cool, you know, but anyway, uh, I am a member of the RHDS core team. And you're all probably sitting there going, what is DS? Well, it's not the handheld. I actually work for the 389 directory server project. And I bet when you came here, you didn't think you'd be listening to a real-life LDAP engineer talk about what they've been doing, because no one really thinks about LDAP anymore. <laughs> so part of that means that what I work on provides authentication and identity management, which is kind of a little bit important. I would guarantee that every day, at some stage, when you log in, there is a directory server that I wrote that probably authenticated you, even if you don't know it. So it's actually pretty important that we actually make secure software. We're also one of the largest foundational pieces of the Free IPA project. Again, this is Red Hat's identity management platform that we sell, and it's pretty important that that's secure and works. We have stupidly strict security requirements, though. Like, if there's any bug or overflow or stability problem and we crash, that's it. Businesses lose heaps of money, people's accounts get owned, and then you end up with password databases all over the internet, which is terrible. It also means that it's very conservative. Directory Server is an ancient project. It was originally developed by Netscape, which if that doesn't make you shudder that I'm working on 20-year-old code, I don't know what will. But no one really wants it to change. People don't want us to move quickly because they just want to keep upgrading their servers and they never want to think about doing the upgrades, patching, whatever. They just want LDAP to work. So this makes for a really, really challenging environment to work in. Thankfully for us, we have a plug-in architecture. And this means that we can actually adapt and create new functionality, but by modularizing it, we can optionally enable it for our customers or for our users as they need. It also means we can deprecate and remove parts. So every time you get a request from the LDAP client at the top, it flows through a set of pre-operation plugins. We can mangle the operation, we can trigger other operations, we can in fact outright reject it. It then goes to the database backend where the query is searched and processed or your authentication validated. And then the result comes back out, and there are post-operation plugins which can either block the response going out to prevent leaking of data, we can inject extra data into the response, we can in fact trigger audit events that say, oh, this person logged in at this time. So let's get on to a little bit about these plugins, and you'll see where I'm going with this. A directory server plugin is a bunch of C code, which is a shared object. And we deal open that code at some point in time. All of our plugin functions have to be generic. So they all take in what we call this P block, the parameter block. It's a huge struct. And if you've ever looked at a 712 byte struct definition, which contains multiple other nested structs of about similar size, it's pretty horrifying. There's some other things going on to break that up. But every single function callback takes this parameter block, and that tells the plugin what is happening in this operation. Was I called as a pre-operation? Is it a bind attempt? Is it a search? Is it a write? Are they trying to delete something? What are they trying to act on? What are they changing? And it gives this information to the plugin, which can then make a decision. The plugin can then alter that request, change it, trigger new requests on from there. We also have to register our callbacks into the server. So when the init function is called, we poke a bunch of function pointers into that parameter block and then give them back to directory servers for calling. So that's how the plugin registration all works. Well, what are we even here talking about then? We seem to have our stuff sorted out. Well, that's the problem, is that we can't be complacent. We might have 20 years of history, and we might be extraordinarily stable and reliable today. We're really depended on by businesses. But we have half a million lines of C. And it's basically like jumping through a volcano or a lava pit. C is awful. And if you want to hear me rant about C, get me outside. This isn't the time or the place. But the problem is, is that we can't reason about our code. We can't tell you if it's correct or safe or anything. We can do some tests, we can read it, we can review it. But no matter what, bugs are still getting through. And we're only human, we're only fallible. I'm a terrible programmer, right? I make mistakes all the time. So what can we do? And this is really 
shown in the way that our development process works. And so many of your own projects will probably have this problem. You'll sit down one night, you'll jugga -jugga -jugga and write out some code, and that's all great. Commit it, run some tests, ship it out to people. Awesome. And then you get a bug. A user raises a problem, it crashed, or a security vulnerability. And then you have to react to that. And you have this really reactive development process where you just can't find bugs before they happen. You're continually chasing your own tail on all of the issues that existed, existed before that you wrote. So what can we do to change this? We really need to, we can't, this isn't a model that works for the future. We can't keep wasting our time chasing our tails when we need to be writing features for tomorrow. So why is Rust good? Because this is what I assume you're all here for, is to hear a bit about that. Well, hopefully you know that it's a type-safe and memory-safe compiler-checked check language. This means that all of your types need to line up and can't be misused in the wrong places. Everything needs to match. All your fun function signatures need to be correct. When you return a result type, you have to handle the error. You can't just ignore it like you can in C. It also means that you can't have null pointer dereferences, which are a really easy way to blow your foot off in C. It means that there's a whole bunch of vulnerabilities which just disappear. It also means we don't have memory leaks, which for you, you might not care about, but for us, when our customers are running this server for six months at a time without ever restarting it, it kind of matters that we don't have memory leaks. It also gives us ways to reason about and prove that our code is correct. Because of the type system, we can actually say, yes, this code is guaranteed to work in at least to not blow up on me. It might have a logical error that I, the programmer, put in, but it's not going to just blow up because I forgot to dereference a pointer somewhere. Mozilla have already got evidence of the stability and correctness of Rust. They're starting to use it in their Firefox web browser. And there's some, uh, what I was, the story I was going to say here is that they've had almost no crashes come back for it, but the other night I was talking with some of their developers, and when they were running the parallel version of the C++ URL parser alongside the Rust one, they found they were giving different output. And it turns out it was because of a bug in the C++ parser. And so they've, been, they've had some really great results from their use of Rust. So can we combine these? <laughs> That's basically the reaction I wanted. <laughs> yeah, so if you ever wonder what my job is like voluntarily working on LDAP and writing C, just imagine this picture, please. So anyway, we don't want to rewrite our server. We have 20 years of quirks that we just can't get rid of. And people rely on that. But we want the safety of Rust. How can we do this? Well, an advertised feature of Rust is that it links to C and that C links to Rust. OK, well, maybe this is possible. But then another project came out called Corrode. And when the slide eventually comes up, Excellent. So I'll keep talking. Why aren't we using Corrode? There you go. Got there in the end. All right, why aren't we using Corrode? And the reason is, is that, again, it comes back to we have half a million lines of C. And we can't just pipe that through, through Corrode. Corrode converts C literally into Rust, what it will represent. We can't just run this, because there's so many subtle issues that could introduce. That might work fine for a small library or something which has better testing than we do. Apparently, tests weren't really cool 20 years ago. Um, but we can't trust the output. We could do this in small batches, but again, we're back to that problem. We need to link C and Rust. So the f throughout this process, I set about to learn whether we could do it. And I learned a lot of lessons. So as I went, I learned these, and so I'm going to summarize them as I go. And the first lesson was that it's going to take a lot of time and mental energy. The reality is, is that I went into unknown territory. I couldn't Google for the answers. It's also another problem is that with a lot of software, you have to think about support. Like I said, I work for Red Hat. I can't just start introducing this into my project. I need to get my team on board. I need to get my company on board. I need the tool chains to exist. But that shouldn't discourage you from starting, because someone needs to start in order to actually start to convince people or to evangelize these technologies and the potential benefits. So decided to roll up my sleeves. My co-author, Josh, who is sitting down here in the front, because I like to call him out and embarrass him, uh, came up on a weekend to Brisbane, and we decided, hey, how hard can this be, right? This will be great. So we went up to the Sunday Coder Club meetup and sat down and went, yeah, all right, let's make a plan. 
Cool. Well, if we can link to C and we compile a shared object, it should all be great. Then all we have to do is just line up all the types for the directory server plugin and then call the APIs as we need. We've got this plugin interface. We may as well just see if we can drop those in. At least we can start encapsulating small pieces of the code and go from there. So this is a little bit of C code for what a plugin would do in terms of um, registering the prebind function. So looking at this, you go, OK, well, you've just got to call slappy p block set with this macro, which gives you the prebind function hook and, and the function pointer, and then poke that in, and then eventually the prebind function will get called. How can we write this code in Rust? And that's where we really started. So the first challenge was, how do we get Rust to, act Rust to actually link with C? So this is a cargo.toml file. Hopefully, if you've used Rust, you will have seen this. And it turns out that the authors of Cargo were pretty smart, and they'd actually done some of this work for me. You stick in this line that says links equals slapped, and bang, lo and behold, Cargo build, and it will find lib slap D and just work. Excellent, great. Well that, well, that was easy. Oh, OK. Why am I giving a talk on it? Then what happened is, is we need the opposite. Now we need Rust to admit a shared object. We need something that C can actually call into and it will actually find. Again, the authors, they'd already thought of this. You just stick crate type dialib in there and Rust will emit a shared object. Awesome. We've now got C able to, uh, we, we can C call into Rust with our shared objects and we can have Rust call back into C. Awesome. Great. That's, that's all the communication channels done. Easy. That was our lesson. We can now build exactly what we need for a plugin. And now that we can actually link to the directory server, this already has all of our LDAP parsing code, so we don't need to rewrite that in Rust, because there's currently no Rust LDAP libraries. So we can actually just start handling operations at this point. This is where it gets hard. So at this point, we realize that that's where our luck run out. So we knocked up a little bit of code for the purpose of this demonstration. Here is some Rust code. You'll notice it's got a lot of question marks. Well, these are the unknowns. This code is meant to be how a registration of that plugin worked. And we need to fill in all these types to make it work. So somehow we need to get a parameter block in. Somehow we need to register our function as a pointer into the code. And somehow we actually need all of this code to actually get called at some point. So how do we bring in all of our integer definitions? How do we get all of our structs and members? How do we even? call the C functions that we need to to get access to our libraries, and let alone exposing it. So we went, all right, all right, what's going to be the easiest one? All right, well, let's have a look at getting some of these uh, macros in. That can't be that hard, right? Uh, it is. So C header files, remember, they are literally included text. There's no like magic in them. It's just when you go include some blah.h, it literally just inlines it. If you want to have a look, just go GCC-capital E and it dumps all the, the like amalgamated junk into your file that is about to be compiled. So we had to redefine things. Thankfully, like I said, we have a very conservative project with stable ABIs. So we can literally redefine these constants without too much fear of them changing underneath of our feet. So we just went ahead and wrote in all of the constants that we needed to do. All right, well, that wasn't so bad. But for those of you in the audience who are paying attention, I did just say we couldn't bring in headers. This means we don't have structs. This kind of sucks, especially when you have a 712 byte struct which contains nested structs, which contain nested structs. You can make Rust definitions of these. But this is a moving target. We don't guarantee the contents of our structs. And so as a result, if we redefined this inside of Rust, almost every other commit would be breaking it. So we went, all right, forget that. What we'll do is we'll just stick C voids in here. If our Rust code just takes the parameter block as a C void pointer and we just never access its members, great. Now we can just ignore the whole problem. And if we ever want to access the member, well, we'll just pass the C void pointer back into C, let it do the hard work and all the macro definitions, and then give us the result. Awesome. So as you can see, we've filled in some of these types. We've got a C void there. We've even for our plugin registration, we, we bring in the P block as a C void, and it all works. So the hard lesson here was that you just can't use C headers in Rust. And for a lot of complex cases, despite the fact that Rust can make C compatible struct definitions, you just can't use them. 
It's too big, it's too hard, they're a moving target. We also have to redefine a lot of constants in Rust as, as variables, and accessing the, those members, you need to have context pointers with C and be able to give them the functions to get things out. And at this point, my notes tell me to pause and take a drink. <laughs> Apparently, I talk fast. Anyway, so we've gotten to this point, and now we're thinking, all right, how about we actually try turning the plugin on? How about we stick it into the server and see what happens? Well, there's a problem. See, this is what a directory server configuration looks like for the plugin. Now, this looks like an LDIF, so if anyone wants to leave the room and vomit, now's a great time. But the magic here that hopefully no one should ever have to touch, that's my job, not yours, is these two lines. The first one is the ns slapd plugin path. That tells directory server, okay, go search the plugin path for a, a shared object with that name. And the second one is the ns slapd plugin init function. This is the exported symbol name from that shared object that we will first call and just punch a parameter block into and hope that we get registered functions out of. And if that doesn't happen, well, we're going to blow up. But it's C, so it's all good, right? We control the plugins, it's all fine. Anyway, so we need to be able to configure our plugin to have, well, a shared object name when we've already got one of those built. But somehow we need to get this init function into our Rust code. All right. So let's crack out readelf, and just for the purpose of this explanation, we'll dump the symbol table from this plugin. <laughs> and as you can see at the bottom, there is the symbol, member of post op init, in all of its nasty C symbol table glory. It's right there and simple. But we're dealing with Rust, and Rust has its origins in C++, so we get mangled symbol names. And they change every single compilation. So we can't guarantee these names are going to always be the same, which is pretty bad. And it's also going to look bad if in a config we have to try and dynamically work this out or do other horrible introspections or reflections and stuff like that. And there's no way I'm doing that in C. Like, I have a life. I've got a girlfriend. She wants to see me at some stage, right? So anyway, again, thankfully, the authors of Rust had thought about this. But actually finding the, the magic keyword to fix this behavior is a little bit annoying. So in our code, it turns out if you stick this no mangle decoration onto your function, that cleans everything up. So when we compile our code, right here at the bottom, we get our init function in a nice, clean, unmangled name. Now, there are some caveats to this, like you've got to kind of be careful about using this, because if you no mangle two things with the same name, Rust isn't quite going to like that, and then you have two symbols with the same name and horrible things happen. But provided you only use this on your export targets, you're fine. So what we learned, we can actually export functions, and we can use no mangle on our entry points, which is awesome, because now, just with that alone, you can now make Rust shared objects which have C-compatible entry points, which you can just call. The next part for us was how do we actually register our callbacks? So a lot of libraries often do register function pointers as callbacks, and uh, as much as C callbacks are horrible and nasty and impossible to trace with GDB, we do use them. So we needed to cast some of these things around. And as you've noticed, our code has gotten a little bit bigger at this point. The first thing is that we need to take this awesome fun and cast it into something that C can understand. And in order to do that, what we do is we use Rust's, well, casting capability. Turns out if you just pull in the uh, libc crate, you can just straight up cast any function to a C void pointer. And surprisingly, this actually just works. Like, I thought there was going to be something a lot more complicated here, but this is just works. The next part is actually telling the parameter block that this function is ready. So we have to pull in our function from libslapped, which is this slappy p block set function at the top, and we say, we mark this as xterm. We say, this is coming from an external library. It's not found inside of this code. Just go look somewhere else, OK? And we have to simulate what the function signature would be. Obviously, we can't bring in a C header file. We can't reuse the C header file signature. So we have to make our own. And we kind of have to make it up and just hope that all the types match up in the right order and everything else. But it works. Again, 
stable APIs are good because if there's churn, this breaks between the linking of the two. The next stage is that we actually need to call it, and that's what we do at the bottom. We have this unsafe call, which actually calls slappy p block set with our now cast void pointer and calls it with the constant, and we can now register that. So we can now register callbacks into directory server. Now you have to note the use of the word unsafe. So remember in Rust it's considered a safe language. This means that there's a bunch of things you can't do. You basically can't shoot yourself. Unsafe doesn't turn off all those checks. It just lets you do two more things. It lets you call more unsafe code, which is great, but it lets you dereference pointers. And this means you can call C functions. The problem with C functions is that they aren't compiler checked by Rust and anything could happen at this point. It could mangle all of the structures you give it, it could stack track, it could uh, segfold, it could do all kinds of horrible things. So you have to call C functions with unsafe to declare your intent that you're going to probably hurt yourself. But anyway, the good thing is we can do it. You need to wrap this though. So I started to learn that calling to C being unsafe was a pain. When I was learning this, there's probably about four hours that I've just skipped over here of tracing through GDB because I blew up the server so many times. But calling to C is unsafe. You really do need to wrap and abstract this and be very careful. Just because Rust is doing the checks for you doesn't mean that C is going to help. All right. So like I said, we blew up the server a lot. And we had to debug it. And you're probably going to have to debug it too if you ever want to sit down and integrate some Rust with C. Now, you can use GDB with Rust. And this really actually helped us pull apart what those issues are, where we had too many dereferences, too few, whatever. You can just use GDB with Rust. There are some caveats, though. The first caveat is that you can't break on native Rust symbol names. That doesn't work. You have to break by line number. And this is not really the fault of Rust. Rust does the right thing. It exports all the debug info that's great. The problem is with GDB, and that GDB doesn't know how to translate those into a nice, nice way, because Rust is exporting them in, uh, with the Rust syntax in terms of crate, library, and delimiters, but GDB doesn't really know how to use that. When you do, get a, uh, when you do break and you get your backtrace, though, everything looks great. You see all of the functions that Rust has gone through. You can see all the parameters you've got. You can start to introspect them. You can pull apart all the Rust structs. Everything's great. It's just that breakpoint caveat. I have learned since then that uh, there is a, with LLDB, there is a native Rust module that handles this a bit better, which I need to investigate. And of course, please go and investigate yourself this. But if you need to, you can fall back to GDB. And really, as a lesson, this is really important. Being able to debug what is happening when your program blows up is really important. When you are linking between something like Rust and C, you will get seg faults, you will have dereferenced something the wrong way, you will need to debug it, and print debugging is not going to help you with this. You really need to be able to get into a debugger, look at where the memory addresses are, what is going on, and what triggered the fault. So at this point, I've been going on a lot about all of the things we've done. And you're like, geez, William, haven't you done it yet? We had. So at this point, it's alive. And we could actually load a plugin. We could run the server. It starts up. We're intercepting operations. And it's working. Woo! <laughs> but it uses a lot of unsafe code and some tricks. We can do better, right? This was a proof of concept. We need to abstract this. We need a much better design. We need to minimize our calls to C. The whole point of Rust is about safety. We need to establish some more safety barriers. Just looking at this code, I've got cast to C void, I'm taking in C void pointers, I've got unsafe. And it, it scares me that I think every time I've written Rust, it involves the word unsafe. But that's probably because I like doing this kind of thing or data structures. So, um, But I don't want other people to be doing that. We want our consumers to be able to write pure Rust types. So we've gone on about the low levels of the seaside, but what do we want people to be using? Well, we want this. We want some code that looks a little bit like this. So obviously for brevity, I've trimmed a lot out. We want clean Rust types. We want to be able to use traits to enforce plugin behaviors. And we definitely don't want unsafe or C void in there. I never want a plugin author to ever see this for directory server. So we sat down and wrecked our brains for a bit and uh, came up with an architecture to solve this. And 
It basically involves man in the middle in the entire plugin system. So, on the left, you have our horrible directory server C code. On our right, we have our beautiful, clean Rust pl plugin. In the middle, we have some Rust code which handles all of the unsafe components. So this way, when our plugin starts up, we register the, me the man in the middle layer as the plugin callback target to directory server. So then when a, co a callback comes in, the Rust code unwraps all the C types, wraps them up into Rust types, calls our Rust plugin, the Rust plugin returns a result type with nice, can return plugin errors or like nice result turn codes. It never has to see an un unsafe. It then hands that back to the man in the middle. It unwraps that. If the result was an error, it turns that into the correct corresponding integer code and sends that back to DS. So we only have to do this unsafe barrier once in the middle, instead of having to do it every single time. So how do we do it? Well, the first part was that parameter block. The parameter block was nasty. So this is where, this is the main communication point between directory server and our plugin. So we needed this to work. And it had to do a lot of things to do with pointers and voids and integers. And I, I'm going to put the link up to my repository for this later. But if you want to see some of the nastiest Rust dereferencing callback, sit like triple layers of dereference from like Rust types into C voids, which have double layers of indirection and then casting, please go and look at pblock.rs. It will give you nightmares. But it is possible. And what it gives us is this nice interface where if we want to set function pointers, instead of needing to reduplicate all of this unsafety all the time, we've abstracted it just like we talked about. We now have that cast in the middle of this function, and we have the unsafe there. And if we and we can wrap all of these, so we have the set plugin start function, the prebind function, all just call the generic set function pointer type. And we can highly test this small piece of unsafe code, and we can guarantee about its correctness, which means that anything safe around it is guaranteed to work as well. This is one of the principles of Rust: is that you have small bits of unsafety which you can assert about, and then everything else which is safe is all good because the compiler checked it. So now we've got the P block there, and we've wrapped it up. When we actually get the data back from the server, such as operational details, sorry, when we actually call functions, when we call callbacks, we need to wrap these things up. So this is the bit of code that sits in the middle and actually handles a callback. All right? And this is an extern function which takes a C void type, it builds a new P block, and then it wraps up the types and calls the actual plugin function with a nice Rust pblock wrapper, which does everything nicely. Then we match on the result that's given to us, which is a result type. And based on that, we unwrap that, and we can give back the LDAP success constant, or we can give back the error as a directory server integer. Great, we've got that callback layer in, in there, and it's now all nice and safe. We can get in the way of callbacks and operations, and we can wrap them up. The last thing is when we actually get data back out of the server. So pblock being our communication layer, sometimes the plugin will say, hey, pblock, I want to know what the current connected operation is. Is it from a replica? Is it like an internal operation? Is it an actual dirty client that's trying to like hack something? Tell me this. So you go to the pblock and you say, I want the operation. So the pblock does all the unsafe bits. It gets the operation out. Then what it does is it wraps up that C void pointer puts it into the next Rust type, and then builds that, and then hands back the Rust wrapper. So now that we've got this P block in the middle, we can now factory out all of our Rust types from there, and the client application never has to see a pointer. The pointer movement is all done under the hood. So at this point, what I hope is obvious is that you really need kind of functional C that takes context pointers. You can't be using struct member dereferencing, you can't be accessing that kind of stuff. It just gets really complicated really fast. You also don't know what's happening in that C API that's changing underneath you with every version. So by wrapping them up into these Rust types with traits and calling back into the directory, uh, into libslap.so, that's its problem. It can deal with all the messy C void types, and we've got this nice plugin with pblock trait. And now if we want to redevelop that as pure Rust, well, our plugins never even have to know that we changed out a C back into a Rust one under the hood. So we can now start to lay the groundwork for a proper rewrite. Awesome. There's one problem with this diagram, though. And I'm kind of tempted to ask if people can see it or not. But it's at the top, all right? And it's this bit here. 
The problem is, is that the man in the middle layer doesn't know what pl functions the plugin wants to register. So we can't initialize the plugin through the man in the middle section. We still need that plugin to somehow be able to register itself. So uh, this is, brings us back. We've got to put unsafe in our code and see void and oh no, it's all horrible. But then I learned about macros and I'm sure that Josh will lynch me for this one because I did something he said I shouldn't. But <laughs> so this macro, which we can now export, when you include this in your plugin, it pulls in the libc crate, it pulls in the pblock type, and when that and it, it provides the no mangled extern function target point. So in your plugin, all you need to do is drop this slappy r plugin in at macro in there with a plugin with a trait bound type, and it automatically wraps the entire call, checks that the plugin has got the right trait bound, which has the init function, does all the conversion, and then runs, which is awesome. And as sorry, as I said. I should look at my notes, shouldn't I? As I said, we pull in the libc crate, we wrap it up, and we export this function. So, we've, so we can use Rust macros to hide our ugly details, and they're type checked. So we're still getting the benefit of our trait bounds, we're still getting all of our type safety, and as again, we, our plugins are never having to see this ugly, ugly code. So what does it all look like in the end? Here is a slightly trimmed down final version of our plugin. And I know that it might be a little bit hard to read at the distance, but at the bottom, we start off, we initialize the plugin. This is our macro. It unwraps, it has our C void, it registers all of our functions. It calls this init function, which actually does it, which builds the plugin manager, it builds the man in the middle layer, and it pushes in our pre-modification function. And then it, and then the server starts up and all the threads go. And then at some point, this callback happens and we can intercept operations. From the parameter block, we can pull out our operation, we can do matching on it, we can see if it's replicated, we can see if it's internal, and we can even send back LDAP results. We can tell the client, go away, we can disconnect them, we can change things. And there's no unsafe here. We've done it. There's one last problem, and that's build systems. Now, you might think auto tools is as poisonous as this pile of goo that Banjo is about to walk through, but AutoTools is the lingua franca of build systems in open source, and it's what we use in directory server. There are things that Cargo just can't do. You can't install arbitrary extra data. If you have a library of Cargo library type, you can't even do like make install and install a shared object somewhere. It just doesn't work. It only builds binaries. So AutoTools, however, can do this, and it can distribute extra arbitrary data. Maybe we can combine them. So. We pull up configure.ac and we check to see if Cargo or Rust see are there. And if not, well, we bail. All right, that's pretty simple. All of the magic, though, is in makefile.am. And this is the part where I'm going to make some people cry. We tell Cargo to build partial objects and emit them. Then what we do is we use autotools libtool to then finish the linking of them into a proper shared object and libtool archive. This nets us the benefit that we actually get version shared objects, which we can install, and when we do make install, it actually ends up in the right paths. In fact, at the top, you can even see where it's distributing an enabled LDF that comes with it. So I would like to talk to the cargo developers about improving this situation, but for now, this works. The lesson we learned is that you can use auto tools with cargo and Rust. How long have I got? Um, you've got about five minutes and then five minutes. Cool. So, We've learned that AutoTools does work and we can do more advanced build scenarios, which means that now is the time where I get to see if my live demo is actually going to play nice for me. So here we go. So we have a terminal here, which I hope that is not going to go away. All right. Cool. All right. So this is the code. All right, and unfortunately, I've had to make the screen a bit bigger, but you can already see a couple of the tail of these things. You can see makefile.am, you can see libtool. This is an auto tools project, but it's actually Rust. And if we have a look at our source code, you can see here, source, lib.rs. We we're in a Rust project. So we'll make install that. And apparently, it wants to download over the internet. So this is the part where I get to tell a story. Um, this was done over the course of about 
a weekend, the original code. Like I said, it was done with Josh. We, it took a long time after that to actually then perfect all the rest of this. We had to do a lot of testing, and there's been a lot of things that had to go into it. But the hardest part is actually like testing it. You can't just do a cargo test on this code. You actually have to spin up a whole directory server and, and start to test the plugins that way. Because cargo just doesn't allow you to generate moxie objects and things like that. So that's been one of the difficulties of this, is that you're going to have long turnaround times. As you go on and you start to build those abstraction layers, it will get easier because you are then able to do things like build other objects which have the same trait and then mock them and then, and then go from that. But um, after that, it's all good. So who's a cargo developer? Who wants to get rid of this annoying problem where it has to try and download all the time? I thought that I had done that before this presentation, but apparently I, apparently it doesn't work. So I did try this, but anyway. If it's, uh, if it's a network thing, you can try uh, re, <laughs> re getting the DHCP leaks. Today in my talk, let's debug problems. Anyway. <laughs> so I won't go through the whole demo then. What I'll do is I'll show you the, uh, actually it looks like it's rebuilt. It's all right. Okay. So, here is the, no, it's not built. All right, great. The demo gods have beaten me. I, I gracefully bow to them. Oh, well. All right. So unfortunately, that means that some of the uh, enthusiasm for this next slide will be a little bit diminished, but Rust with C works. <laughs> <laughs> If you, want to, if you want to see the demo later on, I, I will show you outside when apparently when cargo is better. But the question now is, what next? So for my use, we need to start doing a lot more. We need to start writing some bindings for libraries. The reality is, is that we have approved cryptographic libraries at Red Hat, and one of them is NSS. So I need to get, get my hands dirty and start writing some awful code to link Rust with Netscape security services. Rewriting critical paths in Rust is a good idea. Because, again, we can't assert the correctness of code from a long time ago. We might say, yes, the password modules existed for, what, 10 years. But that doesn't mean that it's right. We just recently actually found a CVE in a module that was more than 15 years old. So starting to rewrite really security sensitive parts is a good idea. We need ASM1 parsing for BER, which then leads natively to Rust LDAP libraries. And there are works to, to go in this direction, because obviously ASN is what you need for X509 as certificate types. This will happen. It also means that for our project, I would like us to start writing new plugins in Rust. We also need other people to get on board. We need companies like Red Hat to start using it to, to get it in their, their distros. I was hearing that Debian have started to do it, Fedora is including it. There is a lot of traction happening, and distributions will need to catch up and start including these tools because people want to use them. We're at the end, and just entertain me this. I want to just thank a couple of people, but one of them is Steve Ellis from Red Hat, who, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here, and RCL for letting us use their Sunday Coder Club. And a big thanks to Josh Driver, who helped me write the code. Without this, it wouldn't be possible. So I'd like to thank you for your time, and I hope that it's been educational. Do we have any questions? Oh, yeah. the hands are up so fast. Um, so my first question would be, from the testing side of things, uh, did you ever look at using stuff like uh, CFFI from Python so you could test the bindings without spinning up a full uh, LDAP server? The problem is that for a lot of plugins, you actually do need an LDAP server to test some of the interactions. But in, in terms of that, like that's where making the mock objects is good, because there's a lot of things that need to be bound to work, and we need those objects duplicated. And there's a lot of state, and databases need to be running, and transactions need to happen, and all this other stuff. So it's really difficult to test. That's a directory server problem, not, a, not specifically a Rust problem. So some of this is, is our own fault, and we are working to improve that in our project. Uh, and similar lines, uh, do you know if there's any work on getting Corrode to just generate uh, shims for C headers rather than converting I believe that modules? there are some projects to do that, but I'm not sure if Corrode is one of them. Again, other research needed. I, at the time, I looked up some, and I can't remember the names of them, but I decided not to use them.
Sorry? Everything? So while we're waiting for the microphone to go to someone, I will be outside if you want to ask more questions too. Um, so uh, do you think that this situation might improve uh, by the Rust team? Um, do you think that eventually they might uh, uh, embed some mechanism for uh, native calls into Rust? Uh, I think that there are possibly some creative ways to get around that, like Rust and Cargo have the ability to then compile C files. So you could have a Rust test that calls a C file, which then calls back to Rust, which then tests it. But I don't think natively the Rust team have much, you know, in terms of like integrating the ability to unit test C in that way. So it's one of those areas where it's up to each project to work out what is the best testing strategy for them. And this is new ground. We are like we couldn't Google the answer to these problems. We were at the coal face. We're finding new solutions to things, and people in this room are probably going to find solutions to things. So. Let me know if you have better strategies for that. Cool. Great work, Will. Um, just wondering, since you have control of the C side of the directory server and you have control of that um, ability, <coughs> its process of linking to an external library, is there, are there any ways that you could make that interface with Rust more easily, like you know, working on the C side rather than just purely within Rust? Well, yes. Like I said, you do need the C, you need some of the C parts to be there so that Rust can actually use them. And just thankfully for us, we had an API that already provided that because of the nature of our plugin interface. I've also written a similar binding for NetSNMP. Uh, I think I had to drink a lot of alcohol after that. The NetSNMP API is not very friendly to external bindings. So there's a lot that a C author can do to improve their exportability of their, their APIs. I think Andrew here wants, wants to have a crack. Uh oh. Can you access C structure, set and get C structure members directly if you are able to um, prove that they're the same structure? I could generate yeah. them from the same yeah, you source can. code. So you can put a C structure. A, C, a struct definition into Rust and mark it as a C type, and it does all of the same struct packing and offsets and everything else, and even the same types. And provided that structure definition is the same as in your C header file, and you can assert that in any way you wish, mm. then you can just straight out just access members. For us, it was not very feasible because, like I said, the p-block is huge. It has hundreds of members, and it really needs to change. But that's our problem. For other projects which have smaller structures, which may be very stable and reliable, yeah, go ahead, redefine the struct in Rust, find a way to assert the correctness between them, and then go from there. Again, Rust has no tools at the moment to assert that a struct definition in Rust is the same as in a C header, but these things may come out of the community and out of things like this talk. We've got time for one more. Well, we've got Rob, a few. You ready? Yeah, just going to quickly add, um, there is a tool called BindGen, which will parse C header files and generate struct definitions. Hey, that means I can probably make this a bit nicer. <laughs> um, what are the overheads of your shim layer like? I didn't notice any when I was performance testing it. So like in the logs, we've got nanosecond resolution and directory server is blazingly fast already. Like, you know, I, I sit there and when people say, oh, we're going to make a thing that like teach you how to like scale to a million hits a day on Amazon, and I sit there and kind of laugh and go, I can get more than that in under like half an hour on my laptop on DS. So DS is stupidly fast, and I didn't see any performance impacts of this. So remember, Rust does compile to native code, and it is checked. So it, it, sh it is overhead. It is more lines of code. But the reason for doing it is architectural, so that one day you can remove it. If you want to look at the repository, which I have on GitHub under first year, that's my online name, you'll find in the DS Rust repo, there's a the way that it's designed, the plugins actually take a plugin v3 trait bound and, and they enforce some set of standards. And it means that one day we can just get rid of the p block that wraps C, because even the p block is trait bound. We can then replace that with a pure Rust one. We can replace that with just something which calls trait bound plugins and things like that. So it's just architectural. Please thank William.